Great pleasure to in introduce or reintroduce Dr. Sarah Cassidy. Um, so Sarah was at the ARC, how many years ago was it, Sarah? Five years ago? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and then she moved on from uh, there to um, a postdoc at, at Coventry, where she set up her own lab, um, and then on to Nottingham University, where she is now. And she is um, not just the UK's leading expert on suicidality research, but internationally, she's got a really big reputation in this important area. Um, and it all started with a 2015 paper that she'll no doubt mention in her talk um, that reported uh, the Cambridge data on suicidality in adults, um, in autistic adults. Sarah, over to you. Thank you. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. So hopefully you can see that. So thank you for that warm introduction, Simon. I'm going to be talking about our work um, over the past uh, sort of five years or so, understanding and preventing suicide in partnership with autistic people. Uh, so it did start in kind of our 2014 paper and this data was from the Cambridge Lifetime Asperger Syndrome Service where we had 374 adults who'd been diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome at that specialist clinic over a nine year period and we asked them all, have you ever felt suicidal and have you ever planned or attempted suicide? And we found really, really worryingly high rates of uh, lifetime suicidal ideation, that suicidal thought, 66%, which is astonishingly high and significantly higher than, than the general population, 17%, and 35% had uh, reported that they had uh, planned or attempted suicide. So really, really worryingly high rates. And in our systematic review of the previous literature that went alongside this paper, we found that only four previous small scale studies had actually ever looked at suicidal thoughts or behaviours in autistic people. So that really sort of, uh, you know, spurred me on to look further at this really, really important, really important topic. And more recently, uh, national uh, large scale studies like this one in Sweden by Tatia Vikoski and colleagues have looked at causes of premature death in autistic people and found that suicide is a leading cause of death in autistic people and in the entire autistic population in Sweden autistic people are nine times more likely to die by suicide compared to the general population matched on demographic variables like age and gender and when you look at uh, subsamples of autistic people those without co-occurring intellectual disability are at even high risk of dying by suicide compared to the general population. So I think it's actually seven, seven times higher in the entire autistic sample, but then nine times higher in those without co-occurring intellectual disability. And when you look at gender, autistic women without co-occurring intellectual disability are 13 times more likely to die by suicide compared to the general population. So that's a really, really uh, important factor because in the general population, most people who die by suicide are male, but in the autistic population, it's females, autistic females without co-occurring intellectual disability that appear to be most at risk. And the reason that we think that that's the case when looking at the data is because there's this huge discrepancy where about 80% of non-autistic people who die by suicide are male, but in the autistic population, it's more even between autistic males and females. So that gender difference that you see in the general population doesn't appear to be there in the autistic population, which suggests that suicidal behavior and death by suicide has very, very different characteristics in autistic compared to non-autistic people. And that we actually have to understand what's different about suicide in autistic compared to not autistic people in order to inform new tailored intervention strategies. And this uh, higher prevalence of death by suicide in autistic compared to non-autistic people and the increased risk of suicide in autistic compared to non-autistic people was uh, replicated in this US study in Utah. So that uh, increased risk of death by suicide, particularly in autistic women, 
compared to non-autistic women seems to be uh, quite a stable finding in two population studies in two different countries. But it's also really important to note, and something that we found in our research, um, that it's not just people with a diagnosis of autism that are at increased risk of suicidal thoughts and behaviours, but also those who perhaps aren't diagnosed yet or those with very high autistic traits. So we know that many autistic adults remain undiagnosed because of lack of autism uh, diagnostic services for adults across the UK. It's quite patchy uh, provision and some areas don't even have any uh, adult autism diagnostic services available. And also because um, diagnostic criteria has changed a lot over time. So there's a lot of people who've grown up without um, knowledge or availability of diagnostic services. And we know from previous research that undiagnosed autistic people are heavily overrepresented in those at risk for suicide attempts. So in two studies looking at patient samples, one in depressed patients and one in patients hospitalized um, for borderline personality disorder, about 11 to 15% of those patient samples met diagnostic criteria for co-occurring autism. And that's much higher than the 1% that you would expect in the general population. And in the patient sample that was of those with borderline personality disorder, those who were diagnosed with co-occurring autism were at significantly increased risk of suicide attempts compared to those who didn't meet criteria for autism and were diagnosed only with borderline personality disorder. So it seems like undiagnosed autism can confer increased risk of suicide attempts in patient samples and is also overrepresented in those groups at risk for suicide attempts. And in a more recent paper uh, by Gareth Richards um, that was conducted at the ARC, we asked those who had attempted suicide, who did not suspect that they were autistic and did not have any autistic relatives, um, to self-report their autistic traits. And we found a shockingly high number of these individuals, 40.6% of them, scored at or above the cutoff for high autistic traits, which could potentially indicate uh, undiagnosed autism. So there seems to be an association between undiagnosed autism and high autistic traits with suicidal thoughts and behaviours. So in practice, it's very, very important not just to think of autism diagnosis conferring increased risk, uh, but also autistic traits and potential undiagnosed autism. But uh, we've had two kind of uh, quite high profile uh, editorials on this topic, and I've been looking at how this um, kind of new research area has been growing exponentially over recent years. And what I've seen is a growing number of counting studies. So, you know, counting how wide and how prolific this problem is, uh, which is really, really important in drawing attention to this really underexplored issue uh, and has been really, really critical. However, we still don't uh, know enough about why this is happening, what the risk and protective factors are and what we can do about it, so what, how we can prevent suicidal thoughts and behaviours and treat these issues in autistic people. And there aren't uh, really any validated tools to aid researchers and clinicians to actually successfully and accurately identify suicidal thoughts and behaviours in autistic people or those with high autistic traits that might not be diagnosed. And we also, uh, at the beginning of this journey, didn't know what the priorities for future research should be uh, because there was so little research, only those four previous studies that we found in our initial 2014 paper. So over a period of uh, three years, um, I was uh, supported by a number of different funding agencies and by the James Lind Alliance that specialise in working with people affected by uh, various conditions in identifying the top 10 priorities for future research. And together, uh, over three years and involving over a thousand autistic people and those who support them, we came up with these top 10 priorities. Um, and there are quite a few here that aren't highlighted, that aren't in bold, that need to be done. And as far as I know, haven't been addressed by anybody, but I'm gonna be talking about mostly these bolded kind of areas. 
Um, so I'm going to go through each one of them uh, in turn. So first, what barriers do autistic people experience when seeking help, which may put them at greater risk of suicide? So as far as I know, we've done the only study to really look at this using a qualitative study. So we co-designed the survey, I'm going to talk about it a bit more later as well, but this is some of the qualitative data from that survey. We asked autistic adults about their experiences of support and treatment for mental health difficulties, self-injury and suicidality. Um, and they reported that tailored support is both beneficial and desirable, but it's very rarely received. Um, a predominant theme was people like me don't get support. They felt dismissed um, because they were seen as coping, because they were seen as having high functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome. They reported that support uh, was geared towards children, that there were long waiting lists and lack of funding. Uh, and when they did encounter or try get actually get some access to support, um, they were met with lack of understanding and knowledge. Uh, they reported not being believed or listened to, not having um, support which was tailored to their unique needs, and that had a real impact on their well-being, where receiving uh, inappropriate support or no risk support could actually lead to uh, increased risk uh, or reaffirmment of suicidal thoughts and hopelessness. Whereas having appropriate support uh, was really positive and enabling for them. So they also described some implications for prevention. So some of the um, uh, recommendations that they had were things like timely access to support, having an autistic pathway, um, creating training developed in partnership with autistic people to avoid uh, reinforcing unhelpful stereotypes. Simple things, uh, adaptations for autistic people, which could be, uh, you know, they are reasonable adjustments, things like continuity of care, um, seeing the same person, having more sessions, because we know from previous research that psychotherapy can be just as effective for autistic and non-autistic people, but autistic people tend to need more sessions. Um, having friendly sensory environments, such as having a quiet place with natural light uh, to wait before a stressful appointment, and having alternative access um, to things like helplines, like the Samaritans, because many autistic people find it very, very difficult to use the phone. Uh, perhaps having things like online text or web-based support would be really, really useful, increase access. And also adapting therapies in partnership with autistic people because many autistic people said that they had real difficulty engaging with um, cognitive behavioural therapy, for example, because it calls upon a lot of their difficulties in communication, identifying one's own emotions um, and things like that. So what about risk and protective factors? So what kind of risk markers may be unique to autistic people or common and shared between autistic and non-autistic people? And considering that we have some, you know, models, suicide models um, developed for the general population, how much do they apply for autistic people and how can they be expanded or uh, adapted to better apply to autistic people? So one model that we started with, that, and this model has been developed for the general population, it's not specifically been developed uh, for autistic people, uh, but it's called the Interpersonal Psychological Theory of Suicide. And it posits that three kind of things, three psychological constructs need to come together in order for a person to um, uh, do a lethal or near lethal suicide attempt. So one aspect is sorted belongingness, which is lack of meaningful social connections and a feeling of being alone. Another is perceived burdensomeness, so perceiving yourself to be a burden on others. And the third aspect is capability for suicide. And that's developed through exposure to painful and frightening events, which uh, decrease fear of death and increase pain tolerance, which enable a person to carry out a le lethal or near lethal suicide attempt. And so we predicted that a lot of aspects of these, this model actually quite resonates with what we know about autistic people's characteristics and experiences, such as autistic people, uh, experiencing uh, social isolation, loneliness and difficulties establishing reciprocal relationships is an external indicator of thwarted belongingness 
and, and uh, lower levels of um, uh, employment, uh, increased risk of physical and mental illness, for example, and low self-esteem are all external indicators of perceived burdensomeness and are quite common in autistic people as well. So we tested, uh, started testing this model in a few studies. So our first study looked at uh, the interpersonal psychological theory in association with autistic traits in the general population. And we, find, uh, we found the um, hypothesized associations so that the uh, higher the level of a person's autistic traits that they report, the more likely they are to uh, feel, report uh, increased levels of thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness and therefore uh, lifetime suicidality. But what we also found was that the associations in this model were weakest at the highest levels of autistic traits, which suggests that in those with the highest levels of autistic traits that these associations um, predicted in the model are attenuated. Uh, and so there might be difficulties or problems in either measurement of these constructs in those with high autistic traits, or there might be other factors that we're missing. But essentially this model doesn't apply as strongly to those with high autistic traits compared to those with low autistic traits. So we replicated uh, this study and expanded it to include uh, capability for suicide uh, in this study. So we compared how strongly the model applied to autistic compared to non-autistic people and what we found was that the predictions of the interpersonal psychological theory were upheld overall. However, again, the associations were significantly weaker in the autistic compared to the non-autistic group. So in this uh, top graph, you can see that the kind of dashed line, which is the autistic group, the association between thwarted belongingness and lifetime suicidality is flatter, which means that it's attenuated, less strong, um, or weaker association between these two constructs compared to the uh, non-autistic group and the same for uh, the association between traumatic life events and suicidality. So our next question from these kind of two studies were are the measures actually capturing autistic people's experiences and is there anything that we're missing uh, from this model that needs to be adapted? So we recently published this paper earlier this year that compared the measurement properties of the interpersonal needs questionnaire and the acquired capability for suicide questionnaire, which are typically used and developed in the general population to measure this interpersonal psychological theory model. And we found uh, a lot of differences, but also a lot of similarities in the way that autistic and non-autistic people responded to these measures. So you can see here that uh, key questions in the belongingness questionnaire, like these days I feel like I belong, these days I'm fortunate to have many caring and supported, supportive friends, are interpreted uh, the same way in autistic and non-autistic people. And we met, explored that using a statistical technique called measurement invariance analysis but we also uh, conducted interviews and focus groups with autistic people to assess how they actually interpreted these questions. Whereas there are some uh, questions that don't seem to be interpreted the same way by autistic and non-autistic people. So in our focus group uh, and in uh, our measurement and variance analysis, autistic people said that questions like these days I'm close to other people or these days I often feel like an outsider at social gatherings they weren't um, similarly associated statistically um, with the uh, construct of belongingness in autistic compared to non-autistic people. And our focus group said the reason for that or a possible reason uh, was because these are kind of everyday experiences for autistic people and aren't necessarily indicating um, uh, thwarted belongingness but experience of being autistic. And we found that the burdensomeness questions uh, were all all operated differently or interpreted differently uh, by autistic compared to non-autistic people. So there could be some, there could be an issue with some of the measures that are used um, to measure this model that may need to be adapted for autistic people and that's where we're going to have a look at next. So we wanted to know whether there are any missing aspects from this model that haven't been measured yet or looked at or considered um, in autism research or uh, also suicide research in non-autistic people. 
So we worked with a steering group of autistic adults. Um, first, we did a literature research search to identify and propose topics to discuss with the steering group. Then we conducted a series of focus groups um, to, with autistic people to help us prioritise those topics and what we should measure in the survey. And then we developed the survey with them and asked for their feedback on about six iterations to make sure um, that it was accessible and that it covered all of the aspects that we wanted to measure. And in this paper uh, shows the quantitative data from this study. And what it essentially shows is that after controlling for a number of factors like sex, uh, age, employment, satisfaction with living arrangements, co-occurring developmental conditions, depression and anxiety, there are aspects that, can, that explain significantly more variance in suicidality. And those uh, additional significant predictors are autism diagnosis, uh, autistic traits in the general population, and in autistic adults, uh, experiences of camouflaging your autistic traits in order to try and fit in better in social situations, unmet support needs and non-suicidal self-injury. So this indicates that there are uh, unique aspects of the experience of being autistic that after um, controlling for a number of common risk markers with the general population explain additional risk in suicidality. So more recently, uh, because in the focus groups and in our previous study, this experience of camouflaging one's autistic traits seemed to be such a kind of uh, strong shared experience in our focus group and the qualitative uh, data that we gathered and also in the statistical analysis um, that came out of the study. We wanted to look at this uh, factor in even more detail. And fortunately at that time, Laura Hull had developed the Camouflaging Autistic Traits Questionnaire. So we explored whether this uh, experience of camouflaging was in any way associated with thwarted belongingness in the interpersonal psychological theory. Because what the focus group, the autistic focus group told us um, was that uh, by camouflaging their autistic traits in an attempt to fit in and be accepted, they felt that none of their friendships or connections were genuine. It was really, really highly stressful and actually contributed even more to feelings of thwarted belongingness. So we attempted to test uh, this proposed model quantitatively because we had this qualitative data. And we started again in a general population uh, kind of sample, non-autistic sample of uh, undergraduate students. Uh, we asked them to complete the camouflaging autistic traits questionnaire to capture experiences of comp compensation for autism related difficulties and social situations and assimilation uh, to fit in with others and not stand out for the crowd. Uh, and we asked, do people with high autistic traits try to camouflage those traits to try and fit in, leading to feelings of thwarted belonging and suicidality? And that's exactly what we found. We did find significant this uh, serial mediation model, these significant associations, where in this uh, sample of undergraduate students, those who reported uh, high autistic traits tended to report that they camouflage those autistic traits, uh, experience feelings of thwarted belongingness and also lifetime suicidality. And what we also found that these associations were even stronger in the assimilation component of camouflaging, which is more relevant to experience of thwarted belongingness, we hypothesized, because it's about trying not to stand out from the crowd rather than more behavioral strategies like uh, um, masking, for instance, or compensation. So from this uh, initial work, uh, we think that the interpersonal psychological theory could have relevance to autism and autistic traits, so not just those with confirmed diagnosis, but autistic traits in the general population, in explaining increased risk of suicidality in this group. And uh, camouflaging uh, appears to be a previously um, unknown in the general population suicidality um, research, uh, but a previously unknown transdiagnostic uh, risk factor, a new risk factor for suicidality. And I think it's really important from this initial research uh, not to inadvertently encourage camouflaging autistic traits uh, in autistic people.
So the third area that we've been working on is how we can best identify and assess suicidal thoughts and suicidal behaviours in autistic people in research and clinical practice. And we've done this in two ways. So looking at evidence for measurement properties of tools in autistic compared to non-autistic people and also adapting the first suicidality assessment in partnership with autistic adults. Um, so in the first stage, and this was part of an uh, ESRC, Future Research Leaders Grant, uh, that I got while I was at Coventry. But in the first stage, we conducted uh, a Cosman systematic review, which identified the most frequently used suicidality assessment tools in non-autistic and autistic adults. Uh, and then focused on the most uh, widely used suicidality tools to assess uh, evidence for and against uh, measurement properties for that tool. And in the first stage of the study, uh, we couldn't actually proceed to the second stage in the autistic group because essentially uh, no tool with evidence of any validity had yet been used in research with autistic adults. And this was published in 2018, so very recently. So although there had been lots of growing research looking at suicidality in autistic people, none of that research had used um, a validated tool in any population. So uh, a lot of studies were using archival data where uh, questions had been designed, you know, for a clinic or for that particular study, but no, um, no research had looked at how autistic people interpret those questions or how accurately they capture um, the construct of interest. But what we did find in the general population is that a very, very short self-report uh, suicidality assessment tool called the Suicide Behaviour Questionnaire Revised or SBQR version 2, um, it had very comparable or even stronger evidence for its measurement properties compared to longer and more expensive tools like the Beck Suicidality Scale or the Columbia Suicide Severity rating scale and you can see that here because more pluses with a maximum of three pluses indicate strong evidence in support of the measurement property whereas uh, some of you can see some of the cells here have a plus and a minus sign which indicates mixed evidence some evidence for some evidence against and minus signs indicate evidence against and question marks um, indicate where uh, the quality, the methodological quality of a study is so poor that you can't make a determination for or against the measurement properties of that tool. So from this, uh, the SBQR looked potentially useful for research and when looking at the items we thought it could be very useful to consider adapting for autistic adults. So in our second study, we compared the measurement properties of the SBQR uh, between autistic and non-autistic people, and we did that both quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, so this is a diagram of the hypothesized factor structure of the SBQR. So it's hypothesizing that these four items all tap into the same construct of suicidality uh, in one factor. And we hypothesized uh, that this factor structure might not be the same in autistic people because some of the items could be particularly problematic. And we specifically hypothesized that items three and four could be particularly tricky and difficult for autistic people to interpret and respond to. So item three asks, um, have you ever told anybody that you were going to attempt suicide or you were thinking about suicide? And obviously that uh, needs a communication component and opportunities to tell others, which could be very difficult for autistic people considering their difficulties in social communication skills and isolation. And item four asks, um, how likely are you to attempt suicide in the future? And we know from previous research that autistic people have difficulty in uh, abstract future thinking and imagining what could happen to them in the future. And we found statistically, uh, using measurement and variance analysis, that uh, the uh, factor loadings between autistic and non-autistic people were significantly different between, for these particular two items. So these um, two items aren't associated with responses on other items in autistic people compared to non-autistic people. And this was uh, kind of confirmed in our qualitative analysis of interview data. So we asked autistic 
people um, to uh, comment and describe what they were thinking and reading about when they were completing this questionnaire. And for example, for item three and four, um, they uh, pointed out that say for item three, have you ever told somebody that you're going to uh, attempt suicide or that you might do it? Uh, a really common theme uh, amongst the 15 people who participated was, well, who would you tell? Um, and it's really, really difficult to, to describe this. It's, you know, difficult to have even normal chat. Um, and for item four, there was a real predominant theme across all 15 participants that it's a future question and you just don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's an important question, but it's impossible to answer. And other aspects of the questionnaire that autistic people commented on, for, uh, for example, for item two, have you ever thought about uh, killing yourself in the past year? Autistic people said um, it doesn't capture the intensity or the thought or the length of time. Like very often, five or more times, that doesn't seem very often at all. That doesn't capture my very often. And does that mean that I'm really bad? And for item one, a lot of people commented that there was something missing between a brief passing thought and a plan. Something missing between it was a brief passing thought and I had a plan. So we ran this uh, again, we made uh, some adaptations to the SBQR and re-interviewed those 15 people to see if our adaptations worked. Uh, and then we did a large online Delphi survey, including 251 autistic people to get further feedback and see if um, our adapted questions were significantly more clear and more relevant than the original version. Um, and the kind of things that uh, changes that we made where, for example, for item one, we really simplified the language and also added in the stage between a brief passing thought and a plan. And we also added follow up questions, which captured things that were um, that autistic people described in our interviews, such as um, not really having made a plan but feeling uh, in the moment um, that they happen to have access to means and then really having a, a really strong impulse to attempt suicide in that moment. So we added a, an item saying, I have seriously thought about ending my life but did not plan how or try to do it. And then questions about impulsivity, plans and access to means. We also uh, changed the frequency questions to capture more of a full range of frequency of suicidal thoughts and capture perseverative thoughts that a lot of autistic people reported, like suicidal thoughts, like one thought uh, lasting for a very, very long time, perhaps even more than eight hours. And we also tried to make item four um, a little less abstract and provide some visual cues um, to quantify very likely to no chance at all. Um, to try and capture that, how likely are you to do this in the future? But actually asking uh, when you experience intense thoughts about ending your life, how likely are you to act on them? Which was um, a kind of framing of a question which had been uh, as suggested by quite a lot of the autistic people independently who took part uh, in our studies. And then finally, um, including communication of intent and past attempts. Uh, so we all the autistic participants said it's important to capture this, um, but not only that, but also who people told. So have you told anybody and who have you told and why haven't you told anybody? So why is that? Because that could be really useful for clinicians to know why that was the case. Is it because they're isolated? Is it because they can't or they don't feel like they can verbalise uh, their internal experiences to others? So in our online survey, our stage four, which took this adapted um, questionnaire, the SBQR, and validated it in autistic and non-autistic adults, we found evidence for measurement invariance between autistic and possibly autistic adults, regardless of gender and whether they wanted to use visual aids, which are those measuring jugs um, to quantify, you know, uh, very often or often. 
So that indicates that this adapted questionnaire can be used with autistic people regardless of diagnosis, which is very important because there could be many potentially autistic people that aren't yet diagnosed or have high autistic traits that could potentially benefit from this adapted questionnaire but aren't yet diagnosed. So I think it's important for this questionnaire to operate in the same way between autistic and possibly autistic adults and our results suggest that that's the case. We also found that, says that this adapted questionnaire was significantly correlated quite strongly with a number of related constructs including camouflaging, depression, autistic traits and we also found that this adapted, this autism adapted questionnaire was significantly more sensitive to autism relevant constructs compared to the original tool. So that means that the, this adapted uh, suicide behaviour questionnaire is more significantly more strongly associated with things like camouflaging and autistic traits compared to the original version of the tool. And we also found a really high correlation of uh, 0.91 um, of uh, scores on this questionnaire uh, at time one and two weeks later. And we also found that our adapted questionnaire correctly classified 88% of autistic and possibly autistic people who reported lifetime suicide attempts, according to item one of the SBQR. So in summary, um, in partnership with autistic adults, we adapted a widely used tool, the SBQR, to better capture suicidality in this group. And we found evidence in support of a range of measurement properties. And we also found that this adapted tool can be used with autistic adults regardless of diagnosis. It's important to note that it's validated for use in research, um, but it is an open source research tool. So if you want a copy or want to use it in your own research, then just email me and I can send it to you. So overall, this is my last slide. Um, suicidal thoughts and behaviours appear to be significantly higher in autistic people compared to other groups. There's some evidence that late diagnosed and undiagnosed adults without co-occurring intellectual disability appear to be most at risk. And that could be because of increased vulnerability to known risk factors that we know increase risk of suicide in the general non-autistic population. Things such as reduced sense of belonging, social isolation, difficulty accessing support and treatment for mental health conditions and suicidality. And we've also discovered new potentially transdiagnostic risk markers that haven't been identified or previously considered in models of suicide developed for the general population, specifically camouflaging one's autistic traits in order to fit in in social situations. And it's really, it appears to be really, really difficult to access appropriate treatment and support uh, for autistic people, but it's potentially uh, life-saving. And it's something that we need to urgently uh, address. And so when we're looking at this top 10 uh, priorities, what I see as the next kind of areas to really move into are things like how should interventions be adapted? Um, how can we uh, further understand how autistic people seek support or the impact of other factors such as poor sleep on suicide risk? And there is research underway. We've got uh, a new NIHR grant that's uh, adapting uh, autism uh, safety plans. Um, so if anybody is interested in that or wants further information, then please let me know. And I'm also aware of uh, other research groups adapting things like dialectic behavior therapy for autistic people that's been shown to have um, uh, real uh, efficacy in other groups such as those with ADHD and borderline personality disorder to reduce or address and treat chronic self-harm and uh, suicidal thoughts and behaviours. So I'd just like to thank all of the uh, people that helped me on this journey and have uh, lead authored and co-authored a number of these studies and also everybody who took part in the top 10 um, a priority setting partnership with the James Lind Alliance and all of our funders. And thank you also for listening. If you've got any questions, then please just let me know. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I should have said at the beginning, many of you will know, I can see lots of applause icons. Um, many of you will know that Sarah, Sarah's group and um,
her research was selected by INSA uh, in an international competition um, when um, they were looking for potential policy briefs and that will be coming out I think next year. So let's um, open up, thank you for finishing on time Sarah, open up um, uh, for comments and questions. Who would like to start? Yonat. Hi, uh, thank you for the fascinating uh, talk on this important topic. Um, it was really like, I really, uh, I don't know if I can use the word enjoyed, but it was fascinating to listen to you. And I wanted to ask two questions, one regarding the research and one regarding the behind the, the scenes of conducting such uh, of such research. So first, have you ever thought about different way of processing or experiencing fear, specifically fear in autism? Uh, and if you have anything to comment on it, on it? And second, the behind the scene issue, because this is obviously such a sensitive uh, subject and you are as a researcher exposed to people that might be at maybe immediate danger. So do you have anything to share about doing such uh, research as a researcher that, I mean, you are exposed to these um, stories or scores and what do you do? Um, what do you do about it? Ethically? Uh, technically and also no, I said, I said ethically. Ethically. Ethically, okay. ethically and technically. Um, great, two, to great, two great questions. Sarah? Yeah, so to do with that experience of fear, in the interpersonal psychological theory, there is, in the capability component, there is reduced fear of death um, as one component. And what we found, you know, so far is that uh, autistic people interpret the questions in that questionnaire the same or that measure operates the same in autistic and non-autistic people which indicates that um, this is an important factor for autistic people and also that it is associated with suicidality in autistic and non-autistic people um, but the actual ex so it uh, kind of suggests that this reduced fear of death is an important factor in suicidality in both autistic and non-autistic people. Um, but looking at it in other ways, aside from um, self-report measures, I think could be important. So maybe use, using things like psychophysiology, because I believe that there's some previous research that shows that this can be quite different in autistic and non-autistic people. We've been talking about different ways of looking at it in more detail, but I don't know of any research, but I think it is a really, really important factor and it is something that is included in general population models. So that's certainly something that needs to be looked at uh, in more detail. Um, but I don't know of anybody else that's doing it. So that would be a really important study if you're thinking of doing that. Uh, and to do with the uh, ethical and practical uh, you know, ways of approaching suicide research um, in general in the non-autistic population, there's uh, quite a few meta-analyses very, very recently that shows in um, online research, so in anonymous online research asking about suicidality, um, asking those questions does not increase people's risk and it doesn't appear to lower people's mood. So doing things like what we do in a lot of our studies, we have Likert scales at the beginning of a survey, uh, at the end of completing the survey, and after a mood induction procedure. Uh, so watching kind of cute funny animals or doing a kind of mind quiz or, you know, something like that or reading a joke. And we find that for most people, um, the uh, mood doesn't change before and after answering questions about suicidality. For those that do have a dip, the mood mitigation seems to uh, increase the mood back up. And uh, if it doesn't quite reach what it was before, it does after taking part, uh, say for instance, you know, a few hours or a day or so afterwards. And people report that uh, the benefits of being able to kind of like release their thoughts 
uh, without any fear of judgment and helping others is uh, sufficient mitigation um, for kind of asking those questions. So there is a kind of evidence base for, you know, online anonymous research about suicidality not causing harm to people. Um, in in-person research, we've done some other studies, we've done psychological autopsy studies, so I've talk, uh, talked to a lot of bereaved family members who've sadly lost a child or a spouse or a very, very close friend to suicide. Um, but many, my experience of conducting those interviews is that they're very cathartic because it's usually the person's first or only opportunity to discuss their experience. Um, it can be helpful in getting access to other support because there's not very good signposting to these people. And also we have a lot of uh, safety kind of standard operating procedures. So we ask everybody before they take part in our study, if there's anybody, like if we're worried about them, who would we tell, who would we inform? It's not always a healthcare provider because to be honest, these people don't have access to very good uh, health or counseling or clinical psychology or bereavement provision. So it could be uh, you know, a close friend uh, for instance, or a support group that they that they attend. Um, so there's always somebody that that we can contact if we're worried uh, about a person. Sarah, I think the other part of Fionat's second question was the impact on you as a researcher. Um, and I remember when Gareth was doing the coroner's study and some of your team going into coroner's offices and having to read the first hand, you know, the, the, the uh, documents relating to a suicide. It's very distressing material. And um, how do you cope as a researcher exposed to, you know, this kind of material at scale? Um, that's a really, really good question. And it isn't something, it is something that's been included in our um, ethics kind of approvals as well. There are a few things that we do so one is we reduce the amount of time that we actually undertake that work. So you wouldn't be doing an interview or looking at going to the coroner's office every single day, um, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, we do it a maximum of, you know, two interviews a week and shared amongst the team. Uh, we'd also have debriefing sessions, so we wouldn't go alone. We'd have somebody with us. So we'd have a nice opportunity, you know, before and after to have a nice long debrief with each other. Um, and to support each other. Um, there's also things like, you know, counselling that are made available, but to be honest, personally, I've never had to use it because I've had such a supportive team. And also when you go to and work with, you know, um, suicidality kind of research groups where this is their, their only kind of research area looking at self-harm and suicidality, it, it, there's a real kind of a really, really nice close-knit team um which you know is really really great at supporting each other and it's actually we feel like it's not a depressing thing to research it's actually a very very positive thing because it helps others um, so if you go to you know a suicidology conference um it was quite surprising to me when i first went because i wasn't too sure what to expect but i sort of embraced it with open arms and i remember i emailed rory before i went to the um uh, you know, my first IASP and he invited me out to dinner and sort of really looked after me and I've kind of been collaborating with him ever since. Mm. So it's a really, really kind of, you know, close knit uh, team and I've never found it um, a depressing or particularly difficult area to research well, because of that. Very good to hear. Let's open it up for a couple more questions. I know we're sort of almost out of time, but who else would like to comment on the talk? Um, Joyce. I think Sarah for your presentation. I'm just wondering, um, with the high correlation between suicide and depression, has there been much research on the use of the more common screening tools for depression and how autistic people interpret those items? Yes, so in kind of parallel, I didn't have enough time to talk about it in my presentation, but in parallel to adapting the suicide behaviours questionnaires revised with and for autistic people, I also did the same with the PHQ-9 
So I'm in the process of writing that up uh, at the moment uh, because we've just you know, finished our data collection for that aspect. But there will be an adaptive version of the PHQ-9 coming out. Okay, that's terrific to hear. Um, anyone else? Um, Varun? Hi, Sarah. Thanks for the very um, thought-provoking talk, uh, talk on this, um, uh, you know, very sort of important subject. I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the, 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 the next part of your research, which you sort of briefly alluded to towards the end, which is about preventing, um, you know, the, the sort of health mechanisms that are there in place. Uh, and I was wondering if, if things like suicide hotlines or helplines and how autistic people navigate those spaces sort of came up in your discussions because usually these are the typical you know go to last minute sort of resources that um, you know many people have and if they're sort of feeling suicidal and um, many autistic people find it very difficult to sort of talk on the phone especially if they are in a particularly vulnerable situation any thoughts on that yeah, that did come up uh, a lot in many discussions um, in the top 10 kind of priority, priority setting exercise and also in our study with uh, the autistic focus groups. Um, yes, they do find it really, really difficult to access things like the Samaritans, particularly because it's, you know, an, a phone line. Uh, we heard, we've heard that a lot. Uh, but I did work um, with Autistica and the Samaritans um, to help them design an online text-based service. Um, so that should be coming out soon. And I've noticed that, uh, you know, due to lockdown and COVID-19, that many more places are now opening up and considering other kind of alternatives to increase access, like text-based services, online messaging services. I can see that happening quite a lot in uh, a lot of local and kind of national charities. Uh, but I agree, accessibility is a real issue. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to comment? Um, maybe I'll just finish with one last question from me, which is, um, I, could, I could see that a, a big cognitive risk factor would be if somebody believed that their family would be better off without them if they were thinking about ending their life. Um, and that might be a failure of empathy because it's unlikely to be the case that their family would be better off without them. The more likely scenario is that their family would suffer forever at the loss of a, a relative, a child, for example. So if the person who's at risk of suicide is walking around with, let's say, a, um, a belief that is dysfunctional, is there a role for very targeted kind of cognitive behavior therapy to really look at those very specific beliefs to help the person change their belief and realize that maybe one break on their behavior uh, might be to consider a different belief that actually, you know, their suicidal act would cause more harm than good. So that kind of cognitive belief that you describe, Simon, is mm -hmm. part of perceived burdensomeness. Yeah. So it's captured in that construct. And one of the questions on that, you know, questionnaire is, um, you know, I, I believe that people would be better off without me or, you know, it would be better off if I, if I was dead, etc. Things like that. So that is not only something that's um, found in autistic people who are considering suicide, but also sure. in the general population there's a kind of trans diagnostic, you know, risk factor for yeah. suicidality. Um, it's possible that, yes, you could um, uh, address that kind of belief and, you know, challenge it. Uh, like you would do in cognitive behavior therapy mm. um i think that if you're you know um, thinking about aspects you know is it a, a failure of empathy or you know something else that could be tested mm. so you could um do kind of you know maybe correlations or comparisons in autistic and non-autistic people looking at perceived burdensomeness and empathy yeah you know perhaps 
Uh, I don't know of anybody who's who's done that or look at you know theory of mind ability. Um, but with perceived burdensomeness, it's kind of considered an erroneous, likely an erroneous you know belief that you're a burden on others uh, despite of evidence. But that's not just in autistic people; it's no. In population. no. Um, just just to add on that, I think that it, it, it could also tap on what you were um, mentioning earlier about gaps in some of the questionnaires, such as the difference between having fleeting thoughts about suicidality and having a concrete plan. And sometimes these are actually recurring thoughts. So they're not fleeting, they are there, they're steady, and sometimes they're even supported by some, some um, feelings within the family. So, you know, I'm, even though I'm a, I'm a grown up, I'm still relying on my parents, still live with them, still financially independent, financially dependent. And, and these are issues that may require um, therapy. I don't know if, if cognitive behavioral therapy may be um, uh, sufficient, because perhaps there's a, um, a physical experience there that may require something um, that's more similar to, to third, third wave CBT, like, like DBT, as you've described. And I'd be, um, maybe later, I'd be very interesting, interested in hearing more about the, the kind of, of clinical or therapeutic experiences you've had with, um, with suicidal people on the spectrum. And thanks for the talk, it was lovely. Thank you. I mean, I'm not a clinician, um, I'm, you know, researcher, so I don't have like direct clinical experience, but I know that Han Anne Hunchins um, is uh, doing the randomized control trial of dialectic behavior therapy and she has a recent mm -hmm. publication but also um, I was on a panel talk with her we were supposed to go to INSA so but you know we weren't able to so we ran a kind of like separate online panel I can share the link with you because uh, it's been recorded that'd be great thanks great so I think we are over time um, so I think we probably have to wrap up but I just want to thank you again, Sarah. Uh, you're a very clear communicator. Um, and it's obviously a very uh, important and distressing topic. Um, there's obviously a very urgent need for trials for suicide prevention. Um, if we can do anything to, to reduce this very alarming suicide rate in, in autistic people. Um, so thanks very, very much again for joining us today and it's great to have you back in the ARC. Thank you for inviting me, it's really really good to see you all and um, to share our progress. Great. Um, so I think we'll close the meeting and see you all next week. Thank you, bye everybody. <laughs>